Well, welcome, whoever is joined. <laughs> um, my name is Dave Jones. I'm a volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association, as well as an advocate for the uh, Alzheimer's Impact Movement, uh, which is the sort of the political arm of uh, the Alzheimer's Association. My personal contact with the disease is my mother-in-law uh, suffered the disease over 10 years. And um, at that time, we didn't even know about the Alzheimer's Association. And uh, if we had known uh, then what we do know now, it would have been a lot easier. So that's kind of my story. Um, on the, as far as the details of the webinar goes, um, if you could, uh, we'll try to, if you put your questions in the chat, we'll try to answer your chat questions at the end. And uh, also we'll give you contact information to uh, follow up, the 800 number, et cetera. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Jen Hoadley. She's the regional manager for Southeast and Massachusetts when she's not scampering through uh, Wampatuck uh, as a runner. And uh, <laughs> I'll turn it over to Jen. Uh, Jen, I guess the first question I'd have for you is uh, uh, kind of introduce yourself and uh, what do you do at the uh, Alzheimer's Association? Sure, yeah. So um, I am the regional manager for Southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, I cover basically from Quincy on down to the Cape and the Islands. Um, right now, everything's kind of been in this remote world. So um, we cover everywhere. Um, if it's not myself, then it's one of my, my colleagues. So we have um, regional uh, managers throughout all of Massachusetts. Um, and what brought me to this organization um, so a couple of reasons. One, when I, when I finished my, my college education, I began working in assisted living in memory care, um, running uh, activities and, and the programming flow and um, really just trying to support the needs of the residents there. And so I did that for, oh, almost uh, seven or eight years, maybe longer than that. Um, and um, I learned a ton. Um, I, I I think the biggest takeaway is that everybody living with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia is an individual and it's going to impact them all in a very individual way. Um, so it's really important to get to know the person behind the disease. Um, it's not just, hey, they have this disease and it's everybody's gonna be treated the same way. Um, lots of different um, ideas that we get from working with different individuals and, and how we're gonna approach um, their care and, and their support in the best way possible. Um, the reason I began doing this at all um, is that it is something that's impacted my family. Uh, both my grandfathers had dementia. One was a more vascular type dementia and the other had an Alzheimer's type dementia. And we can get into kind of what those differences are um, as we go on, but um, that's just, a basic overview of, of who I am and um, what brought me to this. And in my work, um, I wear several different hats. Um, one is just general outreach, letting people know that the Alzheimer's Association exists. Um, I think so many people don't know about us, which is unfortunate. Um, and you don't have to go it alone. We're a resource for people so that they don't have to figure this all out on their own. Um, nobody's an expert in Alzheimer's and dementia until you have to be. So we're here to help you learn and um, kind of examine the best resources for your situation. Um, so I do a lot of outreach. I do volunteer management, um, networking, just again, getting the word out that we exist so that people know where to turn. Um, that's the number one goal is so that they can access the programs and services that we offer. Mm. Excellent. Um, well, actually, why don't we dive right into it? Like, I, I get asked a lot, um, you know, well, what's the difference between uh, Alzheimer's and dementia? You know, what are the, you know, what are the parameters? Sure. Yeah. So, Alzheimer's is um, one reason why somebody would experience the symptoms of dementia. Dementia is really this umbrella term that um, it just means that there having symptoms that you know affect memory, thinking, and behavior. Um, it's going to get in the way of their everyday ability to live their lives, um, sometimes here and there. And as the disease progresses, it can be um, 
more frequent. Um, so oftentimes memory loss is one of the first things that we, we tend to notice. But when we start to look back, we might say, oh, you know, there were other things that may have happened here and there that weren't, didn't stand out as much right away. Um, but that, you know, now that we know what we know, we can kind of pay attention to, to what might have happened before and say, okay, now some of those things add up. So it's really just that umbrella term, dementia, um, that it's going to be um, something that's going to impact our, our cognition, our ability to think and plan and, and execute action, um, and just memory loss in general. And so with that umbrella term, there are a lot of reasons why somebody would experience these symptoms of dementia. And dementia really is not a diagnosis. It's just kind of acknowledging that there are symptoms. We always tell people to find out more and find out the reason behind the, um, why they're, they're getting um, you know, this news of dementia, um, because it can be a lot of reasons. Alzheimer's tends to be one of the more common reasons why somebody might experience the symptoms of dementia, but there are lots of other reasons too. Um, I mentioned before that one of my grandfathers had vascular type dementia, and that was due to him having strokes. Um, so he had had some strokes, and sometimes a stroke can be a large scale event, and other times it can be these, um, they call them TIAs or trans ischemic attacks, and that is a mini stroke. And Sometimes that's really hard to know that that happened. Um, we don't necessarily see like, you know, weakness in one side of the body. Um, sometimes it just seems like the person kind of zones out for a, a, a little bit and then they come back to. And, you know, if that happens frequently, that can cause irreversible damage in the brain. Mm -hmm. So it's important to find out what is the reasoning behind these symptoms of dementia. There's also things that um, can be reversed that may cause symptoms, um, like if somebody's suffering depression and that hasn't been treated, or um, thyroid issues, um, medication interactions. Maybe they've started a new medication, and it could even be something like a new vitamin supplement that's over the counter that just interacts funny with the medication that was prescribed to them. Um, Certain infections may come across um, with those symptoms of dementia, like uh, especially in older adults, if somebody has a urinary tract infection, that can really throw somebody off and cause balance issues um, and cause problems with their thinking as well. So really important to get to the doctor and um, find out what's going on so that you can um, respond appropriately. Certain medications, like if you have an infection, you can get that cleared up and get back to your baseline. Um, and even if it is Alzheimer's disease, you want to know what it is that you're dealing with so that you can plan around that. Um, one of the first things that we recommend to people when they, they call us is that, you know, if you've had that diagnosis uh, of Alzheimer's disease, we want to look at are you prepared for future planning? What is that going to look like? Mm -hmm. And again, everybody's situation is very different. So, you know, depending on what resources you have available around you um, and, you know, finances play into that as well. So talking to an elder law attorney is really important too, just to make sure your planning makes sense for you. Uh -huh. um, these, how accurate these days is the testing? I mean, I know I've done, um, there's a lot of different kind of testing I want. Is, uh, where are we now in, well, I guess, state of the art on testing? Yeah, yeah. So it used to be that you really couldn't get a, a right. diagnosis until somebody had passed and an autopsy could be done. Um, they've made a lot of progress in terms of um, the testing. It varies on, um, you know, where somebody goes, what type of test may be done. Um, sometimes it's brain scan technology. Um, sometimes it is um, uh, using the cerebral spinal fluid to, to look and see if they have those, those uh, markers for the, the disease. Um, so it really varies. Um, there's also PET scans that can be done. Um, oftentimes that is Usually that's not covered by somebody's insurance for this particular situation, although we are working on um, trying to make some, some changes with that. Um, so it varies depending on where you go. And um, if you're involved in, in research, sometimes that 
allows you to kind of bypass what might be covered by insurance and, and be able to um, get, say, a PET scan at no cost and, and just be enrolled in the, the studies as well. So lots of different options for people, um, but they are quite accurate now. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, like, percentage-wise how accurate that is. And sometimes it does take a while to... Um, get to an actual diagnosis. They may want to observe somebody for a while, um, get, you know, lots of different information um, from either, you know, family and friends that are involved in the care, as well as the person living with the symptoms. Um, and that, you know, they're going to try to do a lot of things to rule out what it's not. So oftentimes people will start with their primary care physician and they may do just general blood work just to see if, things look normal. And if that looks normal, they may then um, have them go to a full diagnostic workup, which is a little more intense. Um, they'll do lots of different testing. Um, sometimes the brain scan, sometimes it's paper and, and pen type of testing. Um, and oftentimes it's kind of a little of all of that. So um, they want to make sure that they're, they're getting to the bottom of what's going on in, in the best way possible. Hmm. What, uh, what are the, some of the, what are the, uh... The, the current impact on the disease now. You know, I mean, yeah, I, so, I, I keep hearing it's the sixth leading cause of uh, death in the United States uh, with no cure for one. That is correct, yes. And right now um, with, with COVID at play, that may uh, bump us down a notch, but right <laughs> now we, uh, we know that that's, you know, we're, we're working on the COVID fix, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also working toward a, a world without Alzheimer's. Um, but right now, um, the prevalence of the disease is that uh, there are more than 6 million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease. Um, on average, there are about three unpaid caregivers, like family or friends, uh, that are helping out in that situation. And that varies in terms of you know, how involved they are, whether it's you know, helping somebody um, you know, with finances and, and paying bills, or um, if it's, you know, more intense that it's more the the day-to-day -day activities of daily living. Um, and it's an extremely expensive disease. Um, we know that in 2020, Alzheimer's and other dementias cost the nation $305 billion, and that keeps increasing, um, just because every year the number of people impacted by this goes up. Um, so by 2020, it's expected to rise as high as $1.1 trillion. Um, it's, it's definitely taking a toll on the nation. Um, one of the things that kind of always boggles my mind is that it's a disease that we don't talk about enough. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. just from those statistics, that I know that if I talk to somebody, anybody really long enough, there's a connection to the disease in some way, shape, or form, whether it's in their family or a neighbor or just somebody they know. Um, so it's strange to me that we don't talk about it enough. And I, I think that's that's changing slowly. I think um, more people are getting comfortable with sharing uh, their stories and what's going on. And I think that's so important for us to be able to um, just show a support in our communities. Hmm. Okay, um, so it might lead us to uh, how the Al Alzheimer's Association, um, you know, they, I, I, we have a, the, the different pills of the association for, um, for dealing with the disease. Yeah, so we have um, kind of three pillars of, of what we do. Um, we have our care, our cure, and our cause. Um, so I'll start with the care end of things. We have a 24-7 helpline. Um, and the number we'll put at the end of this as well, but uh, it's 800-272-3900. People can call any time of day or night. It doesn't matter if you have a question or if you um, are looking for a particular resource if, or if you're just not even sure where to start. We, I, I've worked on the helpline before and I believe me when I tell you, we've heard everything. Um, nothing will surprise us. So you can call and, and ask um, away, or if you're not even sure what to ask, just call and say, I have this number and I'm not really sure where to get started. And we will ask you the questions to help find um, the, the proper fit for your needs. Um, so we're a, 
like an information and referral type of um, helpline. Sometimes we realize though that the person might need more coaching or tips around how to care for somebody with the disease or how to live with those symptoms and, and kind of maximize the support around you and, and be able to minimize the, the symptoms as much as possible. So we offer something called a care consultation. So if you call the helpline, you can request a care consultation and it's just a deeper dive look at your situation and formulating a plan with you that works for your, your situation. Um, both of those don't have to be a one stop. You can call and, and schedule meetings with us as much as you need. Um, we're here to support you. And that's, that's the general idea is we wanna make sure that people feel supported, that they have the information they need and that mainly we have help you to avoid any crisis because nobody wants to have to make any decisions in a crisis. So uh, it, the best thing we can do is educate you about what's out there um, for resources and give you the best tips possible to help manage all of that. Um, we also, through our, our under our care pillar, um, we offer educational programs, um, which vary in terms of just kind of like a basic overview of Alzheimer's disease and, and what are the warning signs. And then we also have programs specifically for caregivers that um, help in terms of um, how to communicate differently because there are brain changes that happen with the person who is living with Alzheimer's or a different type of dementia. And oftentimes that does mean we need to change how we communicate um, so that that person can take in that information and process that in a better way that is gonna work for them. Um, we also have programs about um, what behaviors you may expect, what are some common behaviors and how to respond to that. And we have programs specifically for the person living with the, the symptoms of Alzheimer's or a related dementia. Um, so we have uh, education programs. We also have support groups um, for caregivers as well as people living uh, with dementia. And um, we have something called Alls Meetups. And the Alls Meetups are a social type of thing where um, people can get together with other people living with dementia as well as um, their care partners. And it's typically in normal times and we can actually meet in person and go to a museum or um, a concert or you know some even just a coffee shop just to hang out and talk about whatever we wanna talk about. It's not even necessarily talking about living with the disease. Um, it's more just a social get together. Um, and that allows people just to you know, build a, um, a network of friends that understand what they're going through. Um, I think that we all have really great, well-meaning friends that you know, may wanna be supportive, but if they haven't lived it, they don't quite know exactly what you're going through. So it is nice to make those connections with others who do understand it in that way. Um, and right now we are still offering the ALLS meetups. Um, we have quite a few scheduled coming up. Um, and again, people can call our helpline or go on our website, which is alz.org slash M-A-N-H. And um, that's a way to find out what ALLS meetups we have coming up. And they are all virtual right now. So um, you know, we, we are actually still going to museums, but we're doing it via Zoom, um, which sometimes is more convenient for people. Um, you know, it's, it's not quite the same as being there in person, but it does still offer a learning experience as well as that social piece. Um, another pillar that we have is our cure pillar. And um, our goal is to advance research. Um, our, our main goal as an organization is to have a world without Alzheimer's. Um, and in, in working toward that, we do a lot of um, uh, advancement in research. So we advance the understanding of Alzheimer's through our peer reviewed research grant program. Um, we help people find clinical trials through our free service, which is Alzheimer's Association Trial Match. And that's, um, you can go to trialmatch.org and find out more about the different clinical studies that are happening. They vary so greatly too. Um, they look for people who have memory loss, have a diagnosis, have no diagnosis, um, are perfectly healthy, have um, family history. They look for anybody and everybody. And um, going to trialmatch.org, 
you can just look at the various studies. Um, so you can kind of decide um, what you might be interested in learning more about. It doesn't sign you up for any of the actual trials. You would have to kind of take the ball and, and, and roll with that yourself. Um, but it just helps to educate you about the various trials taking place. And sometimes they're trying a new medication. Sometimes it's a sleep study or even just a questionnaire about living with symptoms or being a caregiver, um, healthy lifestyle studies. There's so many different trials out there that um, I encourage people to, to check it out and, and learn more. Um, we also have an international conference that brings together thousands of researchers to share their information and findings. Um, when we're able to collaborate with each other, that is just gonna move things forward faster. Um, we have scientific journals um, and we also have a professional society um, that um, helps to, again, just convene people and, and get people talking about their various findings. Um, and then we, our third pillar is our cause. And um, that is on the advocacy level and helping to develop policy resources. Um, some of that is including the Alzheimer's disease facts and figures, uh, just to educate decision makers on the economic and emotional toll that Alzheimer's is taking on families um, across the nation. Um, we do a lot of advocacy on the national level as well as the state level. Um, our advocate, uh, advocates engage um, elected officials um, in um, a march on Capitol Hill, which has had to be virtual, but we're still plugging away and, and talking <clears throat> to our elected officials um, to just continue to uh, put this at the forefront of their minds um, because it is an important issue. And again, it's impacting a lot of people in our nation. Um, and there are a lot of ways that, that people can also get involved in that. I know that um, David, you're, you're part of that, that movement, which is fantastic and we thank you so much for that. Um, it's important work and I think that that's where we're gonna see changes is by bringing this to attention. Mm -hmm. it, it is interesting when we advocate in, in DC and we have that, as you, we used to do it in person, uh, the March on uh, the Hill, um, we have these, uh, we're all pretty much easy to see with all our purple on. Um, I was really struck the first couple of times that I did that, how many people would come up to me right off the street and talk to me about um, their story of, of someone caring for someone with Alzheimer's or actually has the disease. Um, it was uh, pretty eye-opening. There was, it, it was from, you know, when you go from office to office, there's always somebody stopping you you know, just out of the blue. I mean, it's, it's really pervasive. I was really struck by that. So yeah, I agree with I that. Agree. Yep. Um, what, oh, I ask, so how can people get involved? What are some of the things that people can do? Yeah, so um, we mentioned some of the different pillars and, and there's opportunities within all of those pillars to get involved. Um, so to start, I would say if, if you are impacted by the disease, um, whether a caregiver or somebody living with the disease, the, one of the huge things that I think makes a difference is uh, finding a support group. Um, I mentioned before that you know people who are going through this or have been down this road understand it better than anybody else. Um, Support groups can be a lifesaver for people where you can be with others that are that totally get it. And you can also get a lot of really great tips and information about what resources are available or just um, how to manage symptoms differently that you might not have thought of. Um, I know one of the hot button issues is driving and you know when is it time to stop? And so you can listen to other people's stories and, and kind of try to pick and choose what you apply to your own situation and figure out what makes the most sense. Um, so I would definitely say um, a support group is a, a huge impactful uh, move that you can make in terms of getting that right support. And I will say most people that go to support groups are not what you think of as support group people. You know, it's, it, nobody really wants to have to be there, but it can be a lifesaver, um, just knowing that other people are gonna get it in a way that maybe somebody who hasn't lived this um, wouldn't get it. Um, I encourage people to register for an education program, even if this is not something that's impacting your life. Um, we do have more general education programs like uh, um, understanding 
uh, Alzheimer's and dementia or a know the 10 warning signs, because hopefully it isn't something that ever impacts your life. But if it, if it becomes something, you want to know what to look for um, so you can respond uh, quickly and, um, you know, in the best process, uh, in the best way possible. Um, so I do encourage people to register for an education program and they can find out what's coming up by um, either uh, going on to our website, that's alz.org slash M-A-N-H or calling our helpline, which is 800-272-3900. Um, become an advocate is another great way to be involved. Um, you can talk to your lawmakers and your elected officials to help make changes. And, and there are really great changes that are happening um, just in terms of you know, what kind of training is required and um, in what ways we're gonna interact with people and, and how, um, how much public awareness is being done. Um, so there's quite a bit that's happening that's very helpful, I think, um, for, for caregivers as well as the person living with um, memory loss. Um, <laughs> I guess people will ask, well, what is this going to cost me? <laughs> what, yeah, that's a great what's question. The cost? <laughs> yeah, so um, for families, um, there is no cost to use our programs and services. Mm -hmm. um, that is because of our fundraising efforts, um, like our longest day activity. Um, uh, Walk to End Alzheimer's is one of the largest um, walk type of activity fundraisers in the country. Um, we also have programs like our, uh, run program, which we have a team that runs the Boston marathon and the Falmouth road race, or you can run your own race. Um, there's a ride program. So you, there's a, a cycling, uh, program that we have, um, where people can ride their bikes and, and fundraise that way. We have something called hope on the Harbor, which different corporations can get involved in, silent auctions, we have grant funding, um, we have private memorial giving spirit donations, and then our professional education programs, um, like our upcoming annual map through the maze, um, there is a cost for professionals to attend that because there are um, uh, continuing education credits that we give, so that, that's where the cost comes from, um, but that's coming up in May. And all of those things together help us to be able to offer our programs at no cost to families. Um, which is huge because nobody should ever be excluded from this type of um, service and information that they, they can have access to. Um, other ways that people can get involved are participating in research. Um, even, I mentioned the, the upcoming silent auction. Um, people can attend that and, and bid on items, or if you have something to donate, you know we can, we can talk to you about that as well. Um, hosting a program. So if you own a business and you have employees, we can come and talk, well, right now not come to talk to them, but we can schedule a time to do a Zoom or in the future when we're meeting in person again, um, we can do a program for your employees as an employee assistance program, or you can host a program for the community um, or in your faith community. We're happy to, to do programs that way as well. Um, the probably the best way for people to schedule something like that would be to either call our helpline or you can reach out to me directly. So my email is j h o a d l e y at a l z dot org. Um, other ways to get involved would be um, joining and, and participating in our ride, run, walk, uh, uh, end Alzheimer's, as well as our longest day program, um, volunteer to be trained as a support group facilitator or an education uh, program facilitator, even just calling the helpline. That's a, a way to get involved, um, to learn more about what we do and um, getting you know, available resources to you. Um, and, and, and there's another thing that anybody and everybody can do is talk about it. Again, I think it's something that we are seeing a shift where people are talking about it more, um, but not being afraid to talk about it because I think that the more we normalize talking about it, the more the stigma will go away that um, people have long kind of hid this away and it's been something that you shouldn't be uh, embarrassed by it. You shouldn't be you know, feeling like you have to hide it. Um, I think that just complicates people's situations more when they feel like they need to do that. 
Um, and certainly it's a very personal issue for each person, but I feel like the more people talk about it, the more we're going to see change in the support and um, even just helping getting the word out about what we do. So we do have these little helpline cards that um, if anybody is interested, I can get those to you and you can help spread them around town, um, whether it's at your you know, hair salon or your faith-based community or wherever you feel like people would see that. Um, certainly it's helpful for us to have those out and about so people can just pick that card up and have that available to them. Um, we also are having a volunteer uh, recruitment event coming up on April 27th. Um, we're offering it two different times. One will be at 8.30 in the morning and the other at 5.30 um, in the evening. And if you go to our website, alz.org slash M-A-N-H and sign up for our newsletter, um, there is going to be a link in the upcoming newsletter next week um, so that you can sign up that way. Or again, you can just email me or call our helpline. Um, my email again is jhodley, H-O-A-D-L-E-Y at alz.org. Um, and the helpline is 800-272-3900. Um, so those are all ways people can get involved. And, and you know, we thank people for, for giving back and um, getting involved because this is where we will see the change happen um, and get to a world without Alzheimer's. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. What? <laughs> <laughs> and also on the 27th, that's a good segue, uh, on the 27th, if uh, you want to see uh, more of me, um, I'm going to be doing a, a educational program on the, uh, the 10 signs of Alzheimer's. And um, that'll be on the 27th at noon. And um, that one you'll register for at the website that <laughs> we've mentioned a few times, alz.org. Um, and we're more than happy to have you join us there and uh, continue uh, to learn more about the disease and how you can perhaps help us, uh, you know, like, as we say, a world without Alzheimer's. So, um, do we have, is there any chat things? I don't know if I how to get to the chat. I'm not That's seeing it. anything in the chat just yet, um, mm -hmm. but this is a great time if people, um, do want to ask a question, certainly type that into the chat box um, in the bottom part of your screen um, and we'll do our best to answer. If you think of something later that you didn't ask live, then certainly our um, website um, has a lot of information or calling our helpline. And I did see something just pop up. How long does the disease take to develop before you see warning signs? So that's a great question. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times changes will start taking place in the brain, sometimes 20 years before we even see symptoms. Um, so it is important to live a healthy lifestyle as much as we possibly can to try to um, help our, our um, neurons in our brain to stay as healthy as possible. Um, there are people that do everything right and still can develop um you know, memory loss and, and some issues in their brain, but it's always, you know, err on the side of um, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So living that heart healthy lifestyle is helpful. Um, and in terms of, you know, we often do see this in people that are 65 and older. Um, that is the majority of the people that, that are impacted by the disease. However, we do see people that are younger than 65 develop Alzheimer's um, or another type of dementia. And um, that is a, a younger onset or an early onset of the disease. Um, it does happen and we've seen it happen in people that are you know, 30, 40 years old. So I, I do mention that because I think it is more difficult often to get a diagnosis when you're younger because people often just say, well, this is something that happens when we get older. Um, and although our brains do slow down as we age, um, dementia is never a normal part of aging. So mm -hmm. if it is something that is impacting somebody's cognition and their ability to live their day-to-day -day life, um, it is definitely, certainly something that you should talk to the doctor about. Um, and I think it's always good to establish that relationship um, of what your baseline looks like with your doctor. So um, if you feel like your doctor maybe you know, you're not getting that kind of, uh, the, that kind of support, then 
uh, talk to them more about it. And if, if you're feeling like that's not the right doctor for you, you want to find the right fit. Um, it, it, it's interesting you mentioned early onset. Uh, it's a good um, uh, segue into the advocacy program because if you had early onset Alzheimer's, um, you were not el eligible for any of the the benefits that the government can give you because um, it was geared toward elderly people. And we, part of the uh, advocacy program, we, um, I forget the, the actual bill number, but allow people with early onset to get um, get access to um, the benefits for their previous to that, you'd have to be over 65 again. So that's one of the pluses from the, um, for the advocacy program. Mm -hmm. I remember pushing that one big time. So you got any more questions in there? Yeah, there was a question about how to initiate the conversation with family um, if Alzheimer's runs in the family. Um, and I will say that um, oftentimes people, one of the questions we get at programs is, you know, how much does genetics play into this? Um, and so like a lot of other health issues that may, you know, sort of run in families, it does increase your risk of developing it, but it, it doesn't mean you will develop it. So I would say, you know, being aware of what the warning signs look like is important so that, you know, if you are increasingly seeing those that, you know, you can talk to your doctor and, and make sure your family's aware. Um, I think, you know, just having open conversation about what Alzheimer's and, and dementia look like is um, very helpful for people to not get so frightened um, because I do think it it's a scary unknown. And I think that a lot of times it's the unknown that feels most frightening for people. Um, so just having those conversations, um, not to you know scare anybody, but just to be informative, um, that can be helpful in terms of just kind of starting that. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of really any health issue that people have, um, important to just be open with, with family and friends or people that are close to you just so that they are aware. Um, I think that being open and aware is really the, the, the key here, um, just to make sure that you're getting the right support. Um, and I think also it's important for everybody, whether you have any sort of um, chronic illness or diagnosis, to always just be talking about what you would like your future to look like. So mm -hmm. there are people in your life that you feel like would be um, good to make financial decisions for you when you're not able to do that yourself. And, and that may mean, you know, okay, I go in for surgery and, you know, I, something needs to happen while I'm in surgery, whether it's a healthcare decision or a financial decision, you want to know that you've appointed the right people. So having those conversations, no matter what, um, early on, I think it's important to have that, that conversation as well as making sure that it's done in the legal way. So you want to have that paperwork drawn up um, and making sure that you revisit that every once in a while to make sure it still makes sense for your situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something else down there? <laughs> yeah, so um, the, another question is, uh, can Alzheimer's disease skip a generation? Um, and I, I think, you know, sometimes it can, sometimes it doesn't. So I think it, it varies so much. Um, we get our genetics from, you know, 50% uh, from the, the um, father and 50% from the mother. So I think um, it's hard to know, you know, it, it, does it skip a generation? I often hear that... Um, people say, well, it, it'll skip a generation. I wouldn't necessarily say that that's going to happen every time. So, um, you know, sometimes it, it may, sometimes it may not, uh, but I don't, I don't think that that's like a go-to um, on that. Has it has there been a gender study for people, you know, more females than males or, or is that not really? So, been yeah, um, there are many studies happening regarding um, gender and, and how this impacts the different genders. Right now, um, we know the biggest risk factor is age. Um, and so with age being the number one risk factor, and typically, not always, but typically females tend to live longer than males. Yeah. And um, so with that, we do see this happen more in females. Um, but 
probably just because they tend to live longer. And if age is the number one risk factor, then that's, that's really the reasoning yeah. behind mm -hmm. that. Although there are doing, there are some studies uh, taking place that are looking at, you know, hormones and does that have a piece of this? And, um, but there, there's nothing conclusive on that yet. Yeah. I don't think there are any other questions at this point. Um, if anybody has any others, please chime in on the, the question and answer there. Um, but again, I just, I wanna mention the helpline is a great resource for questions just like this, or like I said before, you can always call and just say, I don't know where to start. Um, we will ask you those questions to help you figure out, you know, what answers you may need for your particular situation. And the helpline again is 800-272-3900. All right, put that on speed dial, yeah. <laughs> That's right. And we have, you know, our, our master's level cl clinicians, they'll answer at any time of day or night. Um, like if you wake up in the middle of the night and you, you have a burning question, call us, somebody will answer. Probably won't be me, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, but well, that's fine. Um, I think we're at the end of the, uh, this has been great. Um, thanks for your time. And hopefully uh, people can join us on the 27th when we'll go through the, uh, the 10 signs of Alzheimer's. And, uh, Thank you so oh, much. We'll, this recording will be um, available through Harbor Media and um, there are usable local, uh, local cable access uh, spots. So uh, thanks to Harbor Media for, uh, for doing the live broadcast and uh, also for following up with the recording. Well, I think that's enough for us now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.